Um, we are about to embark on a journey that started thousands and thousands of years ago. And that is out of the Toltec wisdom tradition. Thousands of years ago in Mexico, there was this tradition where men and women came together in Mexico and scientists and artists came together and they knew a sense of these deep spiritual teachings that they lived by and explored. And then at the, they gathered at the pyramids outside of Mexico City and they named that place, the translation was, where humans become God. Isn't that beautiful? And so that tradition then, like many other traditions around the world at the time of mass persecution, went underground and the teachings became secret. And they were only known amongst you know, families and they weren't spread as, as widely, of course, to the children and there weren't as big of gatherings and that kind of thing because it wasn't safe to do so. But it was understood that at some time those teachings would come forward again. And in 1997, a shaman from the lineage out of the Toltecs, Don Miguel Ruiz, wrote a book called The Four Agreements. Anybody ever heard of it? <laughs> wow. <laughs> We had a lot of those hands up in the first service too. And if you haven't and you're interested in reading it, it's in our bookstore. And if you're interested in just learning about it, we're going to be talking about it for the next four weeks. Because it's one of those spiritual classics that's worth revisiting again and again and again. Yes? <laughs> because every time I know that I look at it again, I pick up something new that I didn't see before. And so I hope you'll find that too if you're familiar with it. One of the things that Don Miguel talks about in the teachings that come out of this tradition are the pro is the process of domestication, how we domesticate ourselves as humans and how we domesticate especially the little ones um, in, in the ways that we want them to make agreement with us. And so there are these agreements that as children we take on because we do, you know, whether they are for the good or not, but we trust our authority figures, and so we take on these agreements. He gives an example of a young girl and her mother. The mother comes home, she's tired, she's, you know, she's um, had a really long day, she's got a headache, and her daughter is singing very loudly. And she's singing and singing over and over again the same song, and it's loud, and it's you know, she doesn't, the mom's thinking, doesn't sound particularly good, you know? And so she's feeling really frustrated and she says to her daughter, I wish you would stop singing. That is just a, a noise I can't handle right now. I just, I don't like the sound of it. But to the little girl, an agreement is made just then. She agrees with her mother because she thinks, my voice must not sound good. And it must not sound good to anybody around me. And this little girl took it to heart and so deeply made this agreement that she actually didn't speak for a long time. Now, the mother has no idea really what happened because she was ignorant of her words. She didn't realize what she had said and how that had affected her daughter. And so she was, you know, kind of in a state of, it's a mystery why my daughter is not speaking. Now, Don Miguel doesn't finish the story for us, but I don't want to just leave it there because we like a happy ending, right? <laughs> so what I would propose is that the idea that the girl, as she grows in her own wisdom, begins to recognize that there are better agreements to be made, higher agreements that are more close to the divinity and the truth of who we are. And she begins to resonate with those agreements. And when she resonates and agrees to those new agreements, the old agreements are broken and fall away because they really were kind of a house of cards anyway, you see? They were made up of limitation, of lack, of untruths. And so they can't really stand the test of time. So the agreements we're talking about, the four agreements, are agreements that do stand the test of time because they are completely founded in the truth, the divinity that we know, the absolute kind of truth. And so the first of these is be impeccable with your word. It's a high goal. <laughs> it's a high bar when you really start to take it on. And, and so if we break it down a little bit, the words that were chosen, peccable comes, the word impeccable comes from peccatus, from Latin, which means without, that means sin, actually. Peccatus means sin. So we know in unity we understand sin as being, from the archery term, missing the mark or making a mistake. 
Don Miguel takes it a, a, actually another place further, and he says that sin is when we go against ourselves. You know when you do that, right? When something just doesn't quite feel right. You remained silent or you spoke something and it's like, mm, just doesn't quite feel right. Doesn't feel authentic, doesn't feel true, doesn't feel an integrity. And so it's that kind of knowing. And so then further the word, the I am part of impeccable is, is without. And so the word then translates to without sin or without going against oneself meaning the essence of us, the divinity of us, the highest part of us. Further, at the beginning of John, the discussion of what is the word. So the first line, and John, the, the Gospel of John, of the canonized Gospels, is considered the most mystical of the Gospels. And it begins with a sort of mystical idea. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God pretty powerful, right? I mean, as you, I've been really sitting with the scripture the last few days, and it's like, if the word is God, <laughs> then every time we speak, every time we form that co-creative substance we call word into the world, we are giving God. And every time we use the word in a way that is not in alignment with God, we are creating the kind of mayhem and negativity and destruction that we don't want to experience in our lives or in the world, right? So this is pretty important stuff, <laughs> this word, this power that we have. In our co-creative understandings in the third principle of unity, we co-create our lives very much by like the song that Lisa just sang, our thoughts are prayers, right? So as we think, as we feel, we create, we begin to create, but the words are what then puts it out really strongly into the world, right? What we say to one another, what we say to ourselves, what is your self-talk like? Is it impeccable? Are you impeccable with the words that you say to yourself? Are you impeccable with the words you offer to those you love the most or put out into the world in general? It's powerful stuff. And so being impeccable with our word is a high calling. You know, there's an old parable about the seed and the sower. Do you remember that one? So the, the um, sower and the seed is when the sower, that's us, and the seed, the word, it's like we got a bag of words and we're headed to the fields. <laughs> and as we're walking down the path, some of the seed falls on the path. We don't even notice. You know, these are sort of like mindless chatter kinds of words, small talk, you know, they just sort of, and what happens, the birds in the story, the birds come and they eat those seeds that fall on the path. And why do the birds eat those seeds, those words? Because they're peckable. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> It's such a groaner, I just couldn't, I, I just couldn't not go there. <laughs> and I know you guys always participate, so I was like, great, all right, we're going with it. <laughs> so that's what happened to the first set of seeds. And the second set of seeds were the seeds that fell on the rocky ground. And these are the ones that sprung up, kind of like the, the weeds that are springing up right now, right? They sprung up, but as soon as the sun came, they withered and they dried and they died away. So these are the words that maybe they have a little gusto at the beginning. You know, you have a little feeling behind them when you speak them. And then, I don't know, you just don't really feel, you don't have really a hard investment in that idea or that conversation. And so it just sort of falls away. So it has a life but it's short-lived, and that's okay. There are some words that are like that. And then there are the words, and these are the words that we don't want to put into the world. These are our judgments, these are our blames, these are our criticisms, these are our harsh words. And those harsh words, those seeds, some of those seeds, they fell into the thorns and the thistles, and they were choked out. Isn't that how we kind of feel, constricted and choked out when we use those kinds of words, when we go against what is true, what is impeccable, what is of integrity, what is of authenticity, what is of the heart. 
But finally, in the last place where the seeds went was in the fertile soil. And you know what happened there, right? They rooted deeply and they grew and they thrived. And it says in the scripture, there was a hundredfold and sixtyfold. They produced and thirtyfold. And they produced according to our faith. And those are the words we're really after. And where do they fall but in the fertile place? And what's fertile but the mind and the heart that we prepare through our practice to be fertile so that we can raise up and offer to the world impeccable words, words that are completely aligned with divinity, words that we re recognize that we are ushering God itself into the world through how we speak. It's big stuff. It makes me want to be pretty silent, actually. <laughs> or pretty thoughtful, anyway, about when to speak. And actually, I, I encourage us to consider that because it's often that the pause that allows us then to really get to that rooted space in the heart, you know? Jesus said that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so it's out of that abundant place, that true place, that honest place, that place of integrity, that we allow then the creation of our words to live on. And don't we want our words to live on? We don't want to be known for saying nasty things. We don't want to be known for not being true and honest with the words that come from our hearts. So what are you saying? How are you sowing these days your words? You know, this, what, consider that, to reflect on that. What am I sowing with my word? And how am I using my word in order to sow what I really want to sow in this world? Love and peace and harmony and kindness and you name it, right? We know those spiritual qualities really well. We know what we want. We know what we intend. This is the big work, the dirty work, the tough work of walking the path, right? This is when we get our hands dirty, literally, in planting the kinds of seeds that we want to plant in fertile ground and to make the space fertile so that it may grow, it may thrive, it may be known, and we can change the places in our world that I was talking about earlier where there feels like there's a lot of other rising and misunderstanding and divisiveness. Yes, it's up to us. Nowhere up there. It's up to us. We're the ones who we've been waiting for, so to speak. We're the future that, that is in the now available to us with this powerful agreement in hand to be impeccable with our word. It's a vow. It's a commitment. It's a willingness to take it on and to look at it from lots of different angles. And to know, too, how impactful these agreements are from the past, we don't have to be prisoner to those, though. As we move toward embodying and being the agreement, those old ones will break away. But it is, it's awesome when we see them and we understand them and we see how much we've changed. So when I was young, about six years old, I was over at David Linker's house, my friend that lived across the street. David's little brother's name was Tommy, and Tommy just pretty much mimicked everything that David did. And we were talking that day about what we wanted to be when we grew up, and I said, I want to be a doctor. And David started laughing, and then Tommy started laughing, and they were laughing hysterically. They were laughing so hard, they were rolling around holding their stomachs. And I was so confused. And I, finally, when they stopped laughing, I said, why? Why are you laughing? I don't understand. And they said, girls can't be doctors. And they laughed and rolled around some more. And man, for a minute, it got me like thinking. And then I thought back to the two doctors I'd had in my short life, and they were both men. And then I thought, I guess I don't know any girl doctors. Maybe it's true. So I could have formed an agreement right then, right? I could have formed an agreement right then that would have kept me small, that would have told me that I would, didn't have the same ability, that I couldn't, my dreams were going to be short-changed in some way because of my biological gender. So the long walk from the front door of David Linker's house to the house where my mom was home and I was going to ask was so long and so heavy. Like, I, I feel like as I speak about it, I'd become six again. You know, I don't know if I'm looking like I'm six, but. <laughs> and it's like that heaviness, right, when you're coming to that, like, difficult conversation, right? So 
I, I probably opened the door very slowly, you know, and I just remember asking, putting the words out there, and it took a lot of courage because what my mom would say back was going to make or break my world, you know? It was, the agreement was going to be made there because the authority figure was going to tell me right then which way it went. And so I remember speaking this across the kitchen and like almost like the words could be seen, you know, it was that heavy, you know, kind of <laughs> traveling over to my mom's ear. And it hardly finished. And my mom must have been in some great space <laughs> because she was so impeccable and on it and like didn't even think about it. And she said, honey, you can be anything you want to be. <laughs> I mean, it really was like the angels were singing, you know? And, and so it's like, we don't remember all those agreements, of course, growing up, but you probably have a poignant one or two that you remember. And it's those that inform our lives. And the important thing is to know that we can change the agreement at any time by taking the higher road. So had my mother not said that, I'm not sure I'd be a minister today because I would have also bought that women couldn't be ministers, and I probably would have never found unity where 60% of the ministers are women. Yay, Yay right? Yeah. <laughs> so the opportunities come to us, and thank God for parents and teachers and authority figures who get this and who are impeccable with their words at those right and important formative times when those little sponges are right before them, right? But we're not always going to be, you know, right on it, right? We, for all the reasons that we've talked about, you know, there are moments of, we're human. There are moments of frustration. There are moments of being off our game. And so to know that for us as adults now, that as we commit to the four agreements, as we commit to this first one, to be impeccable with our words, we don't need to necessarily know all those old agreements, but they will indeed over time break themselves. So for example, let's kind of, sometimes it's just a process, right? So let's take an example where somebody really would like a job that feels meaningful. They don't like the job they're in. It's, it's not fun to them. It's not engaging, but you know, the, the rationale is I gotta pay my bills, I gotta eat, right? Besides, my dad always said that that's why they call it work, because it's not supposed to be fun. Anybody ever hear that one? So this person is holding this agreement, work cannot be fun, and my source is this job. That's how, I, that's how my abundance comes, is through this job. So there's this real limiting kind of idea, agreement that has been made, that is belief system that is holding this person in this small and miserable space. But then they begin to get introduced to some truth or to open up to possibilities and think, well, maybe it is possible because I see that Sally or John or whoever is really loving their job and they actually are prospering from that job. So now I'm kind of thinking it might be possible for me that I maybe could actually begin to follow my dreams. And so you see how the, the agreement begins to break. They begin to release the power over them that that old agreement held, that work has to, can't be fun, that's why we call it work, and that our source is, is not God itself, not the source, but is this particular job. So we get sort of boxed in with that, don't we? And so this is the breaking out of those limitations. When we say yes to I am impeccable with my word, we begin to recognize that that's not the true agreement, that I want to live by that old agreement. In fact, there is something new that's busting through. And I, we can feel then the freedom and the joy and the happiness, can't you, as you begin to shift? And that's what this is all about. Because that's what internally we will experience, the freedom and the joy and the happiness of, of walking the truth, of being in the authentic space of our soul. And this individual who once believed that work couldn't be fun and that their abundance was only the source begins to change and change and change until they're at that point where they're in an affirmative stance of claiming the truth that I am doing engaging and meaningful work and being abundantly prospered, that I can have both and I claim them now. That's the affirmative truth. And so when we say that, we can begin to feel the power of that. And even if it hasn't yet materialized, we're holding that knowing of truth. And we ourselves are shifting from the inside out. And that's how it always works anyway, right? We so often get confused in this world that it works from the outside in. Never really does it work that way. 
I mean, there is an, a flow that is happening always, but real change, we know this, right? It happens in here. And then when that real change, that real shift happens, when the ground becomes fertile again, we're open and we're fertile and we're, we can ca catch all those wonderful seeds that Spirit has been dying to share with us. And we can then thrive and be all that we were meant to be and spread the good and the abundance and do the thing that we have been brought into this world to do and to find our divine purpose and our sense of meaning in following this process. So when we use the word in a way that is not impeccable, you know, we do things like gossip. So I learned about the trifold um, experience that Socrates gave a man who came to him that was about to gossip. And when the man said, I want to share with you something that happened to so-and-so, the story goes that Socrates said, well, first it has to pass the threefold test. Is it kind? Well, the man, hmm. <laughs> Is it true? Hmm. I don't know. It's gossip, right? Is it necessary? Pretty sure not. And so that stops it in its tracks. And so we too can do that for ourselves. When we're about to gossip, when we're about to talk to somebody, talk about somebody who's not there, we can stop ourselves in the tracks and ask ourselves, is this kind? Is this necessary? Is this true? Why do I want to do this? Because it'll make me feel more, there'll be this sort of connection around the negativity of that juicy bit of gossip, or because there, I'll be acknowledged for being in the know. Guess what? You could be acknowledged for being in the know, and you could be far more deeply connected to that person if you share something kind and necessary and true. And so it's slowing things down for ourselves and catching ourselves. You know, be our own Socrates. Be our own philosophical teacher. Because we've got it inside of us to do so and to turn things around. It's also important that we speak to the right person, right? If we've got an issue with somebody, that we speak to that person, not everybody else around them. That's being very peccable with our word, isn't it? <laughs> And so it's, it's addressing the person who we have the concern with or the issue with. This is impeccability. This is truth. This is integrity. This is kind. This is necessary. And it's true. So do you have any of those in your life? Any things that you need to say that you haven't said? Say it. Say what you need to say. Say what you need to say. And, eat, you know, it, and acknowledge the fact that it may not be easy, right? It's not always easy for us to speak the truth. These conversations are courageous conversations. And so we might need to summon the courage and to know that we may not do it perfectly, that, that we may not do it skillfully, that there might be some hurt feelings, but we're there to work through it and to be honest and to move through that process. That's being impeccable with our word. That's making that new, higher level agreement that will break those old agreements and will bring us joy and freedom and ease inside of us, intrapersonally, and between us, interpersonally. And that's what the agreements are all about. It's freeing our whole world, freeing our relationships, freeing our own hearts. And also saying what we mean and meaning what we say. You know, so that's basically kind of keeping true to the things that we say we're going to do or how we're showing up or what we mean. And yeah, we're not always going to follow that one perfectly and things happen and changes come and we make commitments and we need to change them. But that's the key that we speak to the change, right? That's all. So we just don't let it slide, but we tell the people who are involved that we need to make a change to the agreement. Now, if you're one who's constantly being the one who's always changing the agreements, that might also be something to look at. But at least to be impeccable with our word in that we need to make a new plan, a new arrangement. All of this, is this relational work is all part of our spiritual work, you see? It's that ushering in of God itself in us, between us, heart to heart, soul to soul, and within us ourselves, our own self-talk. And when we do, we can't, you know, it's like all of these spiritual principles, until we do it, we won't know how it feels, what it can open up for us, how it can heal us, how it can free energy, how it can bring us greater happiness. We won't know, I could talk about it all day long and you could read the book over and over again, but if you don't do the work, 
if you don't allow yourself to be courageous enough to put it out there, then you won't ever know. So I just want to really encourage you to think about what needs to be said. What do you need to say that you haven't yet said to someone? And who do you need to say it to? And go do it. <laughs> and know that you have a whole community behind you. Know that you have a whole community that is entering these agreements together in these next four weeks that hold you in that sort of cosmic safety net. You know, and that know for you that the highest and best good is there for your heart and for everyone else's who's involved. This is how we build trust in a community. And so, if not here, I always say, you know, here at the church, let this be your laboratory. Let this be your place of experimentation. Yes, we'll make mistakes. Sure, things will get messy. So what? Because we're moving toward that highest and best expression of who we are to be impeccable with our word. And it means something because we are manifesting the very essence of the divine through that. So, to, to wrap this up in terms of how we can do this, just to remember to pause, to see what's in your heart, to see what's true, to see what needs to be said, and to, and to then find a way to say it. It doesn't have to be perfect. It's practice. Just say it the best you can say it, the truth. You know, Remember that out of the abundance of your heart, the mouth speaks. And out of your abundance, the abundance of your heart, the truth will come. God will come, manifest in you, in your world, in our community, at your in your home, in your families. Isn't that what we all want anyway? So let's take this ancient, thousands of years old Toltec wisdom that's been distilled into these four agreements. And really, I want to encourage us, challenge us as a community to own them, to live them, to walk them, to be them, to remind each other and to call each, up, each other up higher. You know, the things that we can create as a community if we free ourselves for these kinds of commitments are beyond mind-blowing, beyond what we could understand, beyond our imagination. And so let's do it. Let's just do it. <laughs> Nothing more to say, right? But to do it, to, to allow ourselves to emerge from that beautiful, silent place that we shared together earlier and to let the words, the truth, the being be embodied by us, to be impeccable with our words. Let's say that together. Let's know that together. Let's really mean it when we say it. Together, I am impeccable with my word. So it is, and so you are. <laughs> <laughs>